So good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Cambridge New Testament Seminar on the festive occasion of the upcoming 90th birthday of Professor Mona Hooker. A special welcome, not only to Mona herself, but also to, to her pupils, many colleagues, friends, and family. Mona has been the Lady Marcus Professor of Divinity here and was elected in 1976, now exactly 45 years ago. And it occurred to me that's the average time between Jesus and the Gospels. So actually, uh, not too long ago, actually. We are very grateful that Mona is still with us in Cambridge and continues to flourish in our seminar. Yesterday, we sent Mona flowers on behalf of the colleagues and the seminar, and we granted her the title of Professor Emeritissima, not with an emphasis on emeritissima as having served out the time, but with a special emphasis on the meritissima, all the merits that Mona's life and also her scholarly life and body. And the presence of so many in today's digital seminar, it's already a record attendance, shows that we are all keen to express our collective congratulations and best wishes. Happy birthday to you, Mona. And I'm sure that people want uh, to join me in hip hip hooray. Hip hip hooray. Today's uh, seminar is quite an historic event, not only because of Mona, but also because it takes the stellar spare pair of speakers to comment on her. First of all, her pupil, Professor John Barclay, arguably one of the best living non-retired New Testament scholars in the world, at the zenith of his scholarship. And also because of our own Dr. James Carleton Paget, arguably one of the best historiographers and reviewers of our discipline, with an unsurpassed overview of the place of every one of us in the larger picture. So together, they will open a diptych of Mona Hooker's scholarly life, and Mona herself will then have her say and share her self-reflection. I will not distract you further from the great speeches ahead, just to inform you that the first part of the seminar will be recorded, and it is being recorded. So if you would like to maintain your privacy, you are advised to switch off your camera. There will be no Q&As after the speeches, no formal Q&As, but I will stop recording at the end and give the opportunity to people to meet Mona informally and say hello. So the recording will only cover the first formal part of today's seminar. So you are able to share any things you would like to share and also raise informal questions. I will now give the digital floor to Professor John Barclay. Uh, each speaker will uh, speak for about 20 minutes, I guess. Uh, and Professor Barclay will speak about the art of asking awkward questions, some themes from the scholarship of Professor Mona Hooker. And he is followed without further announcement by Dr. James Carlton Paget, who speaks about Mona Hooker at 90, some reflections. And then the final word, again, without further announcement, is to Professor Mona Hooker herself, who will be speaking under her self-chosen title of obstinacy and serendipity. <laughs> the digital floor is uh, for John. Thank you very much indeed, uh, George, for your invitation to take part in this uh, great event. And uh, thank you very much to you, Mona, for giving us this uh, opportunity of celebrating your 90th birthday, on which um, many congratulations from us all. I'm going to uh, speak about you in the third person, Mona. I hope you don't mind that, but uh, make it a slightly more formal occasion. Professor Mona Hooker is a remarkable scholar of the New Testament. In the early years of her career, indeed from her master's thesis onwards, she made decisive contributions to the cutting edge quest for the historical Jesus with her work on Jesus and the Servant, her essays on method, 
and her study of the Son of Man in Mark. Later, she returned to the study of Jesus in her Signs of a Prophet, the prophetic actions of Jesus. As her work on the Son of Man took her into Mark's Gospel, she went on to write one of the very best commentaries on Mark, and easily the most accessible. A work that I find continues to hold its own alongside more recent and gargantuan commentaries on Mark. <clears throat> At the same time, she developed her third major area of work, her studies of Paul, with some of her most seminal essays collected in her book, From Adam to Christ. Alongside these top level contributions to scholarship, she's always had an unusual ability to communicate scholarship in a readable form to a wide audience. And generations of students and lay people have benefited greatly from such books as her, um, as her book, Pauline Pieces, or Paul, A Beginner's Guide, alongside her compact and highly accessible books like The Message of Mark, or Beginnings and Endings, works on the Gospels. And that's just to name a few. Professor Hooker has a gift for memorable metaphors. Who can forget her talk about telephone conversations or jigsaw pieces or the wrong tools or pearls on a string? And she's managed to convey clearly some of the most complex disputes in New Testament scholarship to a remarkable range of people from interested church members to first year undergraduates to groups of experts at SNTS. All of these have benefited enormously from her straightforward, clear-headed and direct way of approaching topics central to New Testament studies. But Professor Hooker is a remarkable scholar in more ways besides. The number of glass ceilings that she has shattered is extraordinary, an experience that I know has sometimes been as painful as it sounds. The first woman as Lady Margaret's professor in the Divinity Faculty at Cambridge University. The first female president of SNTS. The first female Cambridge DD. The first woman to co-edit JTS. The list could go on and on. In breaking all these barriers, Professor Hooker has opened the way for so many other great female scholars in her wake. If you look at the bibliography in her first book, and here I'm holding up the um, 2010 um, reprint of her first book, Jesus and the Servant, which was written in 1959. If you look at the bibliography in that book, you will be hard pressed to find a single female scholar listed there. I certainly couldn't identify one, that, that may be my fault, but... Mona, you can tell us afterwards if there were any female scholars you referred to in that book. That's not, of course, because uh, that's not, of, of course, because Professor Hooker neglected them, but simply because there were none to cite. From that point on, however, M. D. Hooker had to be on everyone's bibliography, and although the gender balance is by no means yet right. The world of New Testament scholarship has changed in that respect radically in her lifetime, partly due to her and greatly to our common benefit. I want to focus this afternoon on one feature of the style of Professor Hooker's scholarship. If I could use a metaphor or, or, or an image of my own, it would be to imagine Professor Hooker as a cyclist and many of us have indeed witnessed her cycling around Cambridge. Professor Hooker as a cyclist, weaving skillfully in and around the traffic of New Testament scholarship, much of which was made up of people sitting comfortably in a tram, moving forward, but on preset tram lines that had their destination already determined. 
Those of you who've cycled on city streets that also have trams will know how dangerous that is. If you get your wheel stuck in a tram line, you're bound to suffer a crash. But the confidence to take risks has always been one of Professor Hooker's strong points. And my mental image of her scholarship is of, of her capacity to operate independently of the scholarly consensus. The assured results as they were known and the taken for granted axioms of New Testament scholarship. Following her own path <clears throat> with the freedom of the cyclist while other scholars were stuck traveling along tram lines that too often ended in dead ends. This freedom is not, willfulness, is not willfulness, although it might be related to her lifelong commitment to Methodism. Methodists being the kind of people that establishment Anglicans used to label non-conformist. The freedom comes from her skills in asking simple, straightforward, but awkward questions, which insisted on asking for one thing above all, evidence. That trait was clear from the very beginning in her Jesus and the servant. And that surely is the most influential master's thesis that has ever been written in our field. At the time she wrote that work, there was a strong consensus with heavy theological backing that in Jesus's own consciousness, uh, self-consciousness, or at least in the view of the gospel writers, Jesus was the servant understood as an individual messianic figure profiled in Isaiah 52 to 53. With characteristic care, Miss Hooker, as she was then called by her mentor, C.K. Barrett, went carefully through the evidence to expose the weakness of that so-called assured result. With equal fame, she took on almost the whole New Testament establishment led by figures as influential as Norman Perrin and Reginald Fuller, with her devastating critique of their use of the criteria of dissimilarity and coherence in the quest for the so-called authentic Jesus. What was so effective here was not only her insistence that they were presuming knowledge that we simply don't have, but also her well-argued claim that the methods they were deploying predetermined the results. In a form of critique that we might now call metacriticism, she showed that the search for the unique Jesus, a Jesus unlike what anyone could evidence in Second Temple Judaism, was built on the presumption that unique was by definition good, and that it would be disappointing, even unwelcome, to find a Jesus who was actually in important respects like his fellow Jews. In other words, so-called scientific method was being controlled by ideological, perhaps even anti-Jewish prejudice. She also pointed out that when we search for what was distinctive about Jesus, that word distinctive can mean more than one thing. It can mean what is unique, or it can mean what is, um, uh, what is characteristic, but those are not the same thing. As she rightly pointed out, the ambiguity in English masks a real confusion in argument. And by that simple but profound act of clear headedness, she undermined a whole industry in New Testament scholarship. It took some time for her points to sink in but now it is widely recognized, not least by Dale Allison, that the old criteria for authenticity, which were once we should remember, hailed as a crowning achievement of New Testament scholarship, that the old criteria were no longer, were indeed never fit for purpose. While the tram trundled on for a while along its criteria obsessed tram lines, Mourner Hooker cycled off merrily in another direction. As she rightly pointed out, all the materials in the gospels come to us at the hands of the believing community. And while other people regarded that as a problem for historical reconstruction, 
she saw it as a feature we should analyze with more positive appreciation. Nowadays, her point is taken up within memory studies. The analysis of how early Christian memory both preserved and shaped the image of Jesus in ways that don't allow us simply to peel off interpretation from underlying fact. From the very moment that something happens, its lodging and its recounting in memory shapes its reception, such that there could be no uninterpreted events, even in the lifetime of Jesus. In this respect, although she might not put it this way, Morna Hooker was in the avant-garde of the turn from scientific positivism to postmodern hermeneutics not by moving away from the evidence, but by making us face squarely what the evidence actually is. The same feature can be seen in Professor Hooker's work on Paul, although in a different form. It's perhaps hard for us to appreciate this now, but when she began her groundbreaking work on Paul in the 1970s, Pauline scholarship was still largely dominated by the Bultmanian school of interpretation. Besides Bultmann himself, Bornkam, Kaysman, Hubner, and Konzelman were the leading names in the field. There were voices of dissent from Scandinavia, Stendhal and Dahl, and, a, and there was a British tradition resistant to Lutheranism, W.D. Davis, for instance, and Dennis Whiteley. But no one had developed an overall grasp of Pauline theology that could match the individualistic reading of justification by faith and the sharp antitheses between Paul and Judaism that was dominant in German readings of Paul. True to form, Morna Hooker insisted on looking at the evidence and especially at the evidence that was generally overlooked or regarded as a residue of mythological thinking not characteristic of Paul. Mystical notions of union with Christ, highlighted by Albert Schweitzer, were features of Paul's thought that no one knew what to do with, except to attribute them to the conceptual world from which Paul had emerged and which he had uniquely so-called broken through. Morna Hooker was by now rising through the ranks of King's College London then Oxford, and finally Cambridge. And in a series of seminal essays, she examined the echoes of Adam in the letters of Paul with an attention to allusion and echo that predated the work of Richard Hayes. The more she saw Jesus as second Adam in Pauline thought, the more she appreciated the importance for Paul of Jesus's humanity. And that led to her famous essays in the 1970s and through to the 1980s on interchange in Paul. Once again, observe the skillful weaving of our Cambridge cyclist, who manages to avoid the tram lines and the either oars of mainstream Pauline scholarship. Paul was, of course, focused on the cross, but also, she insisted on the incarnation and therefore the human nature of Jesus. He spoke about the individual, but also, she insisted, about the community in Israel and in the church, a corporate dimension that simply did not fit the Bultmanian scheme. Paul expressed sometimes sharp antitheses between Christ and the law, but always within a schema of fulfillment, not Marcionite binaries. His theology was, of course, based on the kerygma of Jesus crucified and risen, but the ethics is integral to the theology, and the two should not be played off against each other. Of course, Paul emphasized faith in Christ, but this was part of the believer's participation in Christ's own faith. Thus, her reading of Pistis Christu, a topic on which she changed her mind with characteristic candor through repeatedly puzzling over the evidence. In her work on interchange, that is the mutual participation by which Christ participates in the human condition 
so that humans can share Christ's life and destiny, Morna Hooker provided a frame within which many parts of the Pauline jigsaw, to use her metaphor, could start to fit together. Here again, she was at the forefront of a shift in scholarship. Her work was influential on E.P. Sanders in his emphasis on participation in Christ, and it has helped shape one of the major trends in Pauline scholarship since that time. Susan Eastman's analysis of participation, Michael Gorman's claim that Paul advocated a version of theosis, the work of Douglas Campbell and Grant McCaskill, and the current industry of research on Paul's in Christ formula, for instance, by Teresa Morgan, all these follow in the wake of Morna Hooker's interchange in Christ. Scholars and students alike continue to return to her essays for their clear and precise articulation of that theme. But the legacy of Professor Hooker's scholarship is not only in its substance, but also in its style, which I call the art of asking awkward questions. And if there's any awkward question that persists most notably through her scholarship, it is this. What is the evidence? It's characteristic that the conclusion to her Jesus and the servant begins with this sentence. The evidence which is relevant to our study has now been investigated. Along the same lines, her famous essay on using the wrong tools ends, of course, one must have working hypotheses, but it should never be forgotten that these are only hypotheses and that they must continually be re-examined. Going back to the evidence, all of it, in detail, observing what's not there as well as what is, that's the hallmark of Professor Hooker's work. It's been essential in the training of numerous PhD students, including myself, who've had to answer her sympathetic but probing questions in their supervision. But it's also been essential in keeping international New Testament scholarship honest and grounded. One might think that this is a lesson that doesn't need repeating. Of course, we attend closely and fully to the literary evidence of the text and to the historical evidence that lies in it and behind it. But it is not a procedure that one can ever take for granted. And the rigor of Professor Hooker's questioning of the evidence is something that we need now, perhaps more than ever. In our justifiable efforts to relate our text to our contemporary social, political and ideological concerns, it's frighteningly easy to ride roughshod over the evidence <clears throat> or to make it say what we want it to say. Selective citation, glossing over the contrary evidence, impressionistic summaries of complex texts to make them fit our agenda. These have always been temptations for New Testament scholarships, but are perhaps more in evidence now than ever before. In the wars that rage in and around our discipline, there is a notable trend to inhabit incompatible worlds, simply ignoring contrary views with the, with the excuse that there's too much to read, and sometimes with the accusation that close attention to the text is the boring work of so-called splitters, much less exciting than the view of lumpers, and often with more confidence in rhetoric than evidence. Of course, the text and the history have to be interpreted. They're never just naked facts that dictate their own meeting, that, sorry, that dictate their own, meet, their own meaning. But if New Testament scholarship is to remain honest, and if it is to retain its intellectual integrity in a threatening environment, the one thing it must do is remain accountable to the evidence continually beholden to what is there and honest about what is not. If we lose this honesty, we may achieve short-term political gain, but the long-term consequences will be disastrous. In other words, now more than ever, we need people with the character of Morna Hooker, who ask non-aggressively but fearlessly, where is the evidence? Character, I say, 
But what sort of scholarly and personal character is that? An honest willingness to go where the evidence leads. An open-mindedness sufficient to be corrected and to change one's mind. A refusal to be fobbed off with obfuscation and convenient ambiguity. A confidence to speak the truth as you see it, even if all the big names in the room think you're being silly or difficult. And above all, the independence to get off the tram and to steer your bike in your own direction as the evidence requires. I don't know where you've gathered all those scholarly traits, Mourna, but my goodness, are we glad that you have them and that you've displayed them consistently across all these decades in your service to our discipline. I, for one, have been properly corrected by your awkward questions, challenged by your demand for evidence, tutored by your no-nonsense style of teaching and writing, deeply encouraged by your warm support and inspired by all your marks of scholarship. So here is a 90-fold, in fact, I can see now 107-fold, thank you from all of us to accompany our warm congratulations. And here's hoping for a similar conversation with you when you reach your centenary in 10 years time. Thank you, Mona. Good afternoon and uh, many thanks first to John for that very illuminating account of Mourner scholarship and its contribution, far more illuminating I fear than anything I shall offer. Um, I, I want also to, to say how delighted I am Mourner to be here and to talk on this occasion, it's a, it's a real privilege. It has been my privilege to get to know Mourner through several different channels. I attended her lectures as an undergraduate was her colleague for five years and have been her friend for many more. What I will share this afternoon in a talk I've chosen to call Reflections on Mourner at 90, some of the contents of which has its origins in a conversation with Mourner about a month ago in her garden in Cambridge, will be some personal observations drawing on my association with her over more than 30 years, and my knowledge of her as a scholar, teacher and friend. I shall begin by drawing on aspects of Mourner's biography showing how these reveal significant elements of her character, elements which have helped make her the remarkable person she has become. And then I shall proceed to a set of, I hope, coherent reflections. It is sometimes the case that those who experience a difficult period of health when young go on to live a long life. Albert Schweitzer, it was thought, would not see his first birthday, so ill was he as a baby, and yet he survived until he was 90. In the case of our almost nonagenarian mourner, as an adolescent, she was herself very sick. So sick, in fact, that she missed a year at school. Consequently, when she announced that she wished to go to university, her doctor told her that this would have the effect of killing her. But as mourner told me, that made her all the more determined to go. And that determination was once more reflected in her choice to study theology at Bristol University. For when she arrived at the university, she discovered that though the subject had been in the prospectus for many years as what was termed a past degree, there was as yet no department and that most teaching was given in theological colleges since all candidates had been ordinands and obviously men. This was 1950. Warner also learned that Hebrew and Greek would have to be studied and that rather than studying English and maths in the first year before doing theology in addition, in addition to those languages, she would have to learn philosophy, meaning that maths would fall by the wayside. In addition to this, when it came to studying theology in her second year, Mourner had to persuade the university authorities that she wanted to study at Didsbury College rather than at the more conservative Clifton College. The authorities were persuaded and Mourner made her way via the Bristol Hills on a regular basis, either by bus or bicycle, to study there. She also took some classes in the Baptist and Congregationalist colleges. Inevitably, the fact that she was a young woman caused the authorities in some of these exclusively male and perhaps fustian institutions a degree of anxiety, leading one to state that she had to enter the college by the back door, giving her coat to matron and keeping a low profile. All of this seems a far cry from the ready to cook degrees uh, which we have in the main experienced. 
Given the complexities and challenges, it was probably unsurprising that she wanted more, staying on for two more years at Bristol to do an MA degree, which having been examined by the exacting CK Barrett and Kenneth Grayston, ended up rather amazingly, as John noted, and with few editorial changes, being her first monograph, Jesus and the Servant, published in 1959. But what then? Mourner, with the warm words of Professor Barrett ringing in her ears, was intent upon pursuing an academic career. Her first attempt at such a thing at the University of Newcastle came close with Mourner being proximae Kesset to one gaze of a mesh. And there followed other unsuccessful attempts. Meanwhile, Mourna had got a job at the Sunday School Union at Newgate Street in the city of London, grading Sunday School lessons and copy editing and proofreading, a trial run as it were, for the future co-editor of the Journal of Theological Studies. While in this post, she applied for a studentship at Manchester University to work under T.W. Manson, but his early death led to her doing her PhD, stood at the University of Manchester, but actually being supervised by Barrett in Durham. A fellowship at Durham in the arts followed, and a year or so later, she was appointed to a job at King's College London. The date was now 1962. The redoubtable Mourna D. Hooker, some may be interested to know that such a constellation of letters is an anagram for Ode to Honor Mark, a discovery of my former colleague, Marcus Bockmuehl. Mourna D. Hooker, was still very much alive years after the doctor had said that study at university was kill her, would kill her, was now formally ensconced in the United Kingdom's capital city while the swinging 60s went on around her. Harold Macmillan and his cabinet were mocked and marred in scandal, and Harold Wilson's Labour Party and the Beatles and even the English football team appeared to be the future. Looking at her publications in this period, Adam in Romans 1, authority on her head, an examination of 1 Corinthians 11.10, a further note on Romans 1, and the monograph, The Son of Man in Mark, Mourner might have seemed impervious to the cultural revolution going on about her. But she clearly wanted a bit of the action as she was one of the first people to buy a flat in the Barbican. It was that flat and its many problems, a fridge which heated things up, a refuse system which constantly disturbed her, and very noisy neighbors, which led her to apply for a job that had come vacant at Oxford. She posted her application more in hope than anything else and thought about nothing, thought nothing of it. Some months later, she received a telephone call from the Pauline scholar already mentioned, D.H. Whiteley, who announced that she had been appointed to the position and would be expected to take it up immediately, in spite of the fact that she had not been interviewed or even visited the place. In 1970, Mourner arrived in Oxford appointed to a university lectureship for five years. Life in the university seemed strangely disorganized or at least loosely structured. She was told that she could lecture on what she wanted even if it replicated the subjects on which her colleagues were lecturing. And she went, when she rang up the forbidding G.D. Kilpatrick, at that time the Dean Arlen's professor of the exegesis of Holy Scripture, to suggest that we a good idea if the New Testament lecturers got together for a seminar, the learned professor asked her who the New Testament lecturers were. But Mourner plowed her own furrow, and with a fellowship at Linacre College, where she remains an honorary fellow, seemed destined to remain in Oxford. But in 1975, as Professor C.F.D. Mole moved towards retirement as Lady Margaret's professor at Cambridge, she was asked to apply for that job, but refused. Eventually, she was simply invited to take up the position, again with no interview, and on this occasion, having not even applied. In 1976, she became a pre-foundation fellow at the newly created Robinson College and took up her position as Lady Margaret's professor, which she remained until her retirement in 1998. Here then are the bare bones of an unlikely life for a woman born in 1931. Few could have predicted that not only a woman, but a Methodist woman would plow such a successful furrow in the world of academic theology, which was dominated by men and in Oxbridge in particular by Anglican men. Her route, as I have attempted to show, was in some ways circuitous and unexpected, though that is perhaps not untypical for an academic. What is certain, it is as a woman in a man's world, she proved a pioneer. And I repeat here some of the things that uh, John just said. The list of firsts is remarkable. First female lecturer at King's College London, first female Lady Margaret Professor, first female president of SNTS, first female editor of JTS, and so on. 
Interestingly, Morna told me that when she became Lady Margaret Professor, she was informed that there had been a question in Parliament about whether a woman should be occupying such a post. In fact, having consulted a colleague who is an accomplished user of the search engine for the digitized version of Hansard, I think that such an intervention is apocryphal, but it certainly has the ring of truth about it. And while on the subject of Parliament and pioneers, it's a striking coincidence, perhaps, that the pioneering mourner shares a birthday with Nancy Astor, the first female MP. Though before one pays too much attention to such a coincidence, it should be observed with a sense of healthy skepticism that she shares a birthday with Camel Ataturk, Ho Chi Minh and Pol Pot. Mourner would be the last person to extol her achievements, not least as a woman. In fact, she told me that she resented being asked questions by her colleagues as a woman, as if she were a member of a freak show. Charlie Mole, in the introductory essay to Mourner's Festschrift of 1996, edited by John Barclay himself, and the late John Sweet, saw her as someone who had made her way without what he termed vociferating. Mourner, he implied, had come to occupy the position of influence and responsibility she had in a quieter, more diffident way. Her ability above all else, dictating her advancement. Some now might want to question Professor Mole's use of the term vociferate in the context he uses it, and his confidence in the view that women of ability would always advance. These, after all, were words written 24 years ago. Though all would endorse his praise of Mourner's gifts, which John has spoken of so eloquently, and were to see her receive so many distinctions. John, in the title of his contribution to this afternoon's seminar, references Mourner's capacity to ask the awkward question, and in so doing highlights a particular characteristic, namely her independence of mind. Mole, in the essay to which I've just referred, notes that in The Son of Man, in Mark, she risked her reputation by her unfashionable views. While this, no well, while this is no doubt an inherent quality, it may in part have been nurtured by the circumstances in which Mourner set out on her theological studies in 1950. Circumstances which she had to make for herself and where interaction with many teachers and students as would have been the case in a more conventional faculty or departmental context were not available to her. Sometimes the independent-minded, especially the independent-minded academic, can be a tad dogmatic, incapable of seeing that there could be an alternative view to their own. Limpet-like, they cling to their theories, however effective the assaults launched against them. In a discipline as speculative as New Testament studies, this has seemed a strange position to adopt. Mourner, ever open-minded, has always shown herself only too aware of the complexity of the evidence with which she is dealing. And so it's written in a way that, though always concerned to present a particular argument, appears open to contradiction. As she wrote at the end of her much cited essay, Christology and Methodology, my chief plan then is for less dogmatism in our conclusions and the recognition that all our results are only tentative. And one thinks too of her helpful, helpfully generalized conclusion in a commentary on Mark, the gospel was written somewhere in the Roman empire, a coldly realistic assessment of the evidence. Over against the reading of some individuals' monographs and articles, when reading mourners, one senses the presence of a flexible and curious mind. Not only that, but a clear one, too. Mourner's prose is uncluttered and direct, and her many works, unlike the case with some of us, rarely festooned with unnecessary footnotes. Learning is evident, but never in a way which appears oppressive, otios, or pretentious. One of Mourner's favorite qu quotations comes from the 19th century scholar, A.B. Bruce. The diversity of opinion prevailing among interpreters in regard to the meaning is enough to fill the student with despair and to afflict him with intellectual paralysis. Mourner is aware of the range of opinions in any one area she seeks to explore, but mindful of Bruce's admonition, does not feel the need to overburden us with them. Part of that clarity of approach, evidenced in lectures which I attended, as well as books and articles, is exemplified, as John has noted, in pellucid metaphors or examples used to illustrate particular points. Who can forget the eschatological sausage, never committed to prose, but a memorable presence in lectures used to illustrate the tension in Paul's eschatological worldview? I remember as a student considering what such a thing would look like, wondering whether it would be edible or not, or whether it would transcend issues of edibility. Aside from the telephone metaphor to which John has referred, I recall two further ones. In one, Mourner compares Paul's changed view on the law to the sale of washing powder. I won't go on about that. 
But a special favorite of mine, drawn from real life, as it were, is an illustration Warner gives of distorting the meaning of terms without regard to their historical context. To this effect, she recalls cycling down the Woodstock Road in Oxford and seeing what she terms a lurid sign, stating that Jesus said that I am the Christ. After noting that her first reaction was to say that Jesus made no such statement, according to the Gospels, she continues, what were the citizens of North Oxford to make of this statement? Unless they already had some Christian commitment, how were they to understand it? The claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, makes sense only within a particular culture. Close quotes. Ironically, perhaps Mona may have been the only uh, one of the citizens of North Oxford to tarry by that sign. And as the spinner of such illustrative exemplar, she has earned the right to criticize others' use of the same. So one recalls with a sense of mirth her attack upon the famous pearls on a string metaphor used by form critics to describe the apparently chaotic way in which Mark arranged his pericopes. Only a man, Mourner noted acidly, could make such an observation. For all women know that they take care in the way they arrange pearls on strings. The concern with clarity is reflected in Mourner's interest in accessibility. In a way that is rarer than it should be in scholarship, the former Lady Margaret's professor has combined publications of a straightforwardly academic kind, which have, as John has shown, contributed significantly to a set of developing debates, with works which have a more outward looking, less guild obsessed character, what one might term haute vulgariste. In this context, it is striking that when one puts Mourner's name into the Google search engine, the first headline is Mourner Hooker at Amazon. And the second is Mourner Hooker on eBay, fantastic prices on Mourner Hooker. Mourner's commitment to clear communication encouraged even nurtured by working for the Sunday School Union in the late fifties, also reflects elements of her character, which I've always hugely appreciated. Her straightforwardness, her honesty and integrity, her loyalty, and her laudable inability to trim her opinions to suit the circumstances in which she finds herself are all excellent colleague, uh, qualities and a colleague and a friend. However, on occasion, one might have hoped for a bit more trimming. I think in particular of marking exams with her, when she tended, no doubt out of a strong sense of maintaining standards, to be a very exacting marker, a tendency usually reserved for the zealous novice, as I was then. In trying to persuade her to raise a mark, I often felt like an auctioneer on a wet Saturday in an undistinguished market town, trying to extract a few more pounds from the skeptical punters for a damaged late 19th century Toby mug. And in all this, one must not forget her courage, shown not just in her professional career, but in the way she coped with the death of her beloved husband and companion, David Stacy, who was taken from her tragically early and without whom she's lived for more than a quarter century. No one, of course, is just an academic or, or a teacher. And that is certainly the case with Mourner. Articles and books often finish with reflective observations of a hermeneutical kind. And it is difficult to read Mourner's concluding comments on the ethical in implications of interchange in her essay, Interchange and Ethics, and not gain a sense that there is a symbiotic relationship between lecturing dais and pulpit. Few will know this, but Mourner has been what is termed in Methodism a local preacher since 1957, and is still an active member of the chapel. She has contributed greatly to the education of other local preachers. Some will know, for instance, of her imposing work studying the New Testament, which was specially written for this purpose, and compliments David Stacey's comparable work on the Old Testament. The warmth in which she is held by churchgoers in general, and her sincere commitment to church life of whatever de denomination, are seen in a brief article dated the 28th of March 2018, which appeared in the Telegraph and Argus, a local West Yorkshire newspaper, entitled Top Religious Scholar to Speak at Church Service in Ilkley, the reader is informed that Mourner will give nine sermons in eight days. Even in her mid-80s, comments the awed journalist, this animated academic makes no concession to age. The vicar, Canon Philip Gray, after noting her academic achievements, states that when he had met Mourner a few weeks earlier, he was surprised at the number of interesting questions she was asking about the church's activities in Holy Week. And the article finishes with a statement from Mourner. Once I'm in my stride with my sermon, ready to for delivery, I hope to have plenty of time to familiarize myself with the beauties of the town and countryside about which I've heard so much. 
One wonders whether that inc activity included a visit to any local windmill. There are, I think, at least 21 in the area. For one of Morna's great enthusiasms is molinology, an interest which she attributes in part to the fact that she spent some of her childhood in Mill Hill, a suburb of London, which, perhaps unsurprisingly, sported a mill as its symbol. But more importantly, she states to the aesthetics of the windmill, and perhaps more obscurely, but appropriately for a person who has made it their business to be interested in detail, to their gearing. Coincidentally, the mill section of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings was first introduced in the year of Morna's birth. Morna's energy and her enthusiasm for life, to which the newspaper article just quoted so vividly witnesses, are seen in many other ways too, in her ongoing activity for her college, Robinson, where as one of the pre-foundation fellows, she remains an active member of the governing body and a regular attender of many college events. In the way she continues to write and research. At our meeting last, no last month, she commented to me rather ruefully that she hadn't written much recently, an observation which reminded me of the title of a talk to be given by the then 98-year-old distinguished Cambridge epigraphist Joyce Reynolds entitled Plans for Future Research. And in her attendance of this very seminar, which for many years she chaired and to, and to which she continues to contribute. She appears to remain forever green, appropriately perhaps when one recalls, as I'm sure some of you present here with botanical interests will, that there is a famous version of green paint known as Hooker's Green, devised by the botanical and especially pomological illustrator William Hooker in the first third of the 19th century. It's a pity that Morna is not related to this talented man, though she is related to another talented Victorian botanist and illustrator, Sir William Jackson Hooker, the first director of Kew Gardens who lived at approximately the same time. Commenting on Hooker's green, one expert notes that it is light fast, meaning that it's stable for decades and centuries with little degradation in hue. As we celebrate your 90th birthday, Morna, may we all not only applaud you for your many achievements as scholar, teacher, and leader in the field, marvel at your vibrant longevity, express our gratitude to you as a colleague and a friend, but may we also wish you more years of fulfilling and happy living. <clears throat> well, for once in my life, I'm speechless. Uh, um, now I know what it's like to listen to one's own obituary, um, except that I think uh, both John and James have been much kinder than anyone would be in, a, in, in an obituary. After all, they knew I was listening, didn't they? And uh, um, <laughs> obituaries can't be read by the subject. <sighs> People sometimes ask me, how did you get where you are? Um, and uh, that is a question which I find a great puzzle, which is why I suggested that um, I might talk about two subjects, the one being sheer obstinacy, which I think is partly um, how I got to be where I am, and um, both John and James have hinted at this. Um, if I am told that I can't do something, I immediately want to do it, um, or am the more determined to do it. So when I was told I couldn't possibly go to university, I dug my heels in and decided straight away that that's where I was going. Uh, when my teachers at school said, oh, you can't possibly read theology, women don't read theology, I um, started to root around and see whether in fact it was possible and discovered that it was. Though since I'd been left to do the research myself, I perhaps ended up at going to what was not quite the most obvious place to go. Um, as um, James, I think it was hinted, it, it wasn't exactly um, geared for strange women coming to read theology. Uh, the reason I chose it, I, I got some, um, I got some um, prospectuses from, from both Durham and um, Bristol, and I saw that in Durham you had to learn Hebrew, and I thought, heavens, never. Um, and Bristol didn't mention Hebrew, so I applied to Bristol. Um, 
only to discover that um, the degree had just been made an honours degree and for this I needed Hebrew and therefore I was faced with reading, trying to learn Hebrew and Greek in one year, um, which led me to have very little sympathy with some of our undergraduates who protested that they couldn't possibly learn a language in a year. Uh, I had to grapple with two. Uh, I went on being obstinate, I suppose, um, um, especially when it came to um, digging my heels in and going to the best college in, in Bristol. Um, and then in insisting that I really did want to teach in a university when all the posts at that time, with the very rare exceptions, such as Newcastle, which um, James has mentioned, uh, were reserved for um, ordained um, Church of England clergy, uh, which meant that as a woman and not ordained, I was excluded. Women, of course, couldn't be ordained in those days. So there were one or two openings, but they were very, very rare indeed, which is how I ended up editing Sunday school lessons, which was not the most fulfilling task, but in a way was fortunate in that it did teach me the um, elements of copy editing and proofreading which I have found a very useful skill in later life. But the other aspect, which is surely even more important than my sheer obstinacy, is what I would call serendipity. Things have somehow dropped into my lap. The first of those, coincidentally um, and perhaps strangely, was the fact that I was made to read Hebrew. Um, as I've already hinted, this was a great shock, but I am eternally grateful that I was made to learn Hebrew because it has been so important in my studies later on, an essential tool in the kind of work that I was doing. I was very fortunate in the subject which I did for my MA, um, the servant, an example of what was then called the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament, uh, which is now given the somewhat grander title of intertextuality. But at that stage, it was not uh, so common as a topic, but it has burgeoned in the intervening years. And um, well, I suppose I was fortunate in taking on this, this topic of the servant because as has already been said, I had soon discovered that everybody else was taking an orthodox view, um, which made me question whether in fact it was true. Um, I remember we had problems when it came to um, uh, Kenneth Grayston um, was um, involved. He was going to be one of the examiners, I seem to remember, but he needed an external and he said it's extremely difficult because you've been rude about every scholar in the country. Well, fortunately, there was one exception and that was C.K. Barrett, so he was appointed as the other examiner, so I was fortunate. Uh, I was a little astonished when I um, went out on this limb, uh, as far as Jesus and the servant was concerned, um, denying that Jesus might have thought of himself in terms of that passage in Isaiah. A, a few late, years later, I found a scholar describing this view as the new orthodoxy. I was a bit indignant about that. I had enjoyed being a heretic and I didn't really want to be regarded as orthodox. I was also fortunate in uh, landing a research post in, in Durham, which gave me more time to do research. And um, I was also lucky in that, I suppose it was the um, appearance of, of the servant book that um, led to an invitation to write a commentary on Mark. Uh, this commentary on Mark was to be on a new series on the New English Bible translation. 
um, which um, had just come out um, in the 50s. Um, and um, so I said, well, I'll do it when I finish my MA. And of course, I didn't finish my, my, my PhD and I didn't finish that till, till 67. So, so Mark got somewhat delayed and it got more and more delayed as I was doing more and more teaching. And eventually the publishers <clears throat> decided to drop the whole series. <clears throat> and I, obstinate as I was, decided I would continue to write this commentary, even if I didn't have a publisher any longer. Uh, and then happened to meet um, Henry Chadwick one day in the corridors of the Divinity School here in Cambridge, who said, do you happen to know anyone who would like to write a commentary on Mark? Uh, so I said, yes, please. Um, and um, my commentary became the um, Black Mark commentary. But it took me about 30 odd years to write that commentary. And again, that was a very fortunate thing because it is amazing how much our attitudes to the New Testament changed over those 30 years. I was brought up on Vincent Taylor's uh, commentary on Mark, known as the 50 shilling Taylor because it cost 50 shillings, which um, to the young won't be a thing. Uh, but in those days, there were a, a famous um, a brand of tailors who were called uh, the 50 shilling tailors. So uh, Vincent Taylor's commentary on Mark, which cost two pounds and uh, 10 shillings, was known as the 50 shilling tailor. And, and we were all brought up on it. And it asked questions mainly from an historical point of view. And over the 30 years that I was writing that commentary on Mark, our attitudes to the Gospels changed and changed and changed until I used to say there was a new method of approaching the Gospels coming out every year. And the result of this was that my typed up manuscript of Mark kept being cut up and torn in pieces and little bits inserted with sellotape. Uh, until the whole thing was totally um, unreadable and I had to start all over again, by which time I was fortunate enough to be able to type it on a computer. So uh, editing it became so much easier. But it was um, a fascinating um, um, evidence to me of the way in which the questions the scholars ask of the text changed over those years. So I was fortunate in being asked to write that commentary. I was fortunate in the, the work on Paul, um, which I had put to one side in order to work on the Son of Man in Mark. When I began to work on it again, um, it was it emerged and, and then Sanders produced his work. And in that post Sanders um, period, um, that kind of um, approach to Paul took root. So that was all very fortunate for me. And of course, as um, has been hinted, all my major teaching posts uh, dropped into my lap. I was invited to go to King's College London to fill a gap when Christopher Evans couldn't go. And and um, in fact, I managed to stay in Kings for nine years and I was very happy in Kings. I was very happy in Oxford, strange place though I thought it was. Um, and I have been very happy in um, Cambridge. So I've had three posts which have um, come to me, um, um, dropped into my lap and um, which I have all enjoyed. Questions, yes, um, John mentioned my habit of asking awkward questions. Uh, and it does seem to me that when there is an impasse, it's quite often because people are asking the wrong question. Um, and sometimes one needs to look at the whole thing from a different angle. Uh, the Pistis um, Christu, um, 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 is I think it, it, that issue is a, is a good example of this because um, scholars were so um, 
ingrained in, in the 19th century idea of a grammatical approach of objective and uh, subjective genitives, that it didn't occur to them that you didn't have to categorize them into these two little boxes, and that maybe there was another way of looking at the issue. Um, and perhaps the grammatical rules were not quite as important to Paul as uh, some later scholars believed. Looking back at my very first work, which I finished, good gracious, I finished it in 1955, so that's an awful long time ago. Um, and I am horrified at the way I did it. Uh, and I'm horrified because, of course, our methods have changed. And I was doing it as Vincent Taylor would have done it, though, though Vincent Taylor disagreed violently with my, um, my um, conclusions. Um, he said it might have been written by a pious Jew. And I took that comment as a great compliment. Um, I was unbiased. I could have been a, a pious Jew looking at the evidence. And it's as though it was inbuilt into the assumptions that I had to come to a good Christian conclusion. Um, and I was throwing all the, um, the, the, the assumptions aside and saying, let's look at this in another way. Um, but it was, a, it was an old fashioned way of looking at the um, material. But again, I have been fortunate in that it doesn't really matter because the question I was really involved in was whether in fact one can um, attribute this, this use of Isaiah 53, not just to Jesus, but in fact to the, to the early gospel writers also, whether it was such an important um, text for them as later Christians came to believe. Um, so, simple questions. Yes, I'm, I'm a simple person, really. Um, I, I just ask the obvious questions. I, I go back to basics and say, well, what is the evidence, as, as John has said? Um, I'm sorry about the, the Hansard um, um, story being apocryphal, James, though you have provided me with another example of how an apocryphal story can convey the truth. Um, and I always think apocryphal stories can, in fact, um, convey the truth. But, but, but that's why they're invented, because they, they express the, um, the ethos of the time. R.H. Lightfoot is, is said to have um, written that um, he, he was always, always asking questions. Um, and he um, was horrified by the dogmatism of some of his, um, his fellow scholars. And he wrote, if only they would say, we do not know. And I, and I used to suggest that all of us should have on our desks those four words, we do not know. Uh, we often state what we believe, we, with great uh, dogmatic assertions. Um, it, it, we like to get across our opinion, but at the end of the day, we've always got to go back and ask questions. Um, so that is what basically I have attempted to do. I have, uh, I began life as a child asking questions and here I am at 90, or nearly 90, still asking questions. But when I um, sit here listening to these glowing appreciations of somebody they call Mona Hooker and they seem to think it has something to do with me, uh, and I can't really believe it, but then I think, well, it was all worthwhile. And to have colleagues, students of this caliber who always kept me on my toes, I am extremely grateful. And I am extremely grateful to all my colleagues who have um, allowed me to keep on asking questions and who seem to expect me to answer, ask questions um, um, because that's what I'm still doing at the seminar. So 
Thank you. Thank you, George, for arranging this very special occasion. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mona. This has been an, a very historic hour with a uh, unprecedented attendance of more than 100 connections, which uh, speaks volumes of uh, appreciation and with such a stellar team of uh, speakers offering a marvelous contextualization and characterization uh, of you. And it's so much appreciated that you also added your uh, great and impressive uh, autobiographical uh, note. So uh, we will now continue with a informal uh, unrecorded part and I will stop uh, recording now.